So, um, I am not the person you want to applaud, but welcome to Authors at Wharton, Adam Grant. I could not be more delighted to welcome Rain Wilson. Wow. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Adam. Nice to see you. You know, it is not every day that the world's greatest business school welcomes the world's greatest salesperson. <laughs> Um, can I call you Dwight? No. <laughs> Don't! All right. Um, I have so many questions for you. Good. And our students had a lot of questions for you, too, so... Wonderful. I've sp well, some of them are not wonderful. Okay. But hopefully you're going to have fun with them anyway. Do you want to start with those? No. Okay. Definitely not. All right. We have to warm up first. Okay. Um, but I've sprinkled them in throughout the flow of tonight's conversation. Very good. Um, I guess the place I want to begin is... How did we come to know you? Uh, we all obviously love The Office. Some of us have binged it more times than we can count. Uh, I think you're, you played the most iconic character of our time. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Um, but we don't know much about how you got there. So you give us the one of the most story. iconic bald heads of all time. <laughs> I, I wish I could say that was a deliberate decision. Mr. Clean. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Barkley, Adam Grant. No one has ever had that thought, but you're but welcome. You. Um, tell us the backstory. I know you were a theater actor for a long time, yes. and this was not part of your plan. Not at all. I, um, so I was a nerdy little disturbed kid from suburban Seattle, and uh, I grew up kind of with a television kind of raising me and watching all of those great sitcoms from the, from the 70s. And I saw all those incredible comic character sidekick actors and, um, you know, like Jamie Farr from MASH and, the, and Reverend Jim from Taxi and uh, Bill Daly from Bob Newhart. And I just loved those ancillary characters and loved comedy so much. I was such a comedy nerd. I would, I would record uh, Monty Python sketches on a Panasonic tape recorder held up to a PBS <laughs> television station at like 1 a.m. to record uh, Monty Python and then memorize the sketches. And uh, then when I started doing theater, I. I kind of thought, hey, you know, I'm pretty good at this and I can make people laugh. Maybe I'll go to New York and study theater. And that's really where I thought I was going to make my living. You know, I thought I'd be down at the Walnut Street Playhouse here in Philadelphia doing, you know, Long Day's Journey into Night and playing characters and transforming. And that was really my focus for the first 10 years or so. I spent 10, 13 years total in New York kind of pursuing a life in theater. and never really making it above the poverty line uh, as an actor in all truth. So, you know, the idea of being like a, a star or a celebrity or, you know, making a lot of money and uh, being a part of uh, one of these like most iconic shows, like, like one of those shows that I grew up watching as a kid is beyond my wildest dreams and not at all the path that I thought I was gonna take. Oops. Uh-oh. I feel like it worked out okay though. It worked out just fine. Look at me, look at this, it's incredible. And I wrote a book too, we'll get to that later. Oh, we're gonna talk about Soul Boom for sure. Yeah. But what, so what happened after a decade? What, what led you to TV? Well, I was doing this tour, it was a bus and truck tour of Shakespeare plays. So I spent two years on a, on a bus with a group of like 20 actors going from high school to college to community center doing uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet and Two Gentlemen of Verona and night after night after night doing 10 a.m. matinees in high school cafeterias and at the end of this long long stint on the road I was on the road with this actor Jeffrey Wright who's been in you know all kinds of uh, Westworld and lots of shows and great movies and uh, we got back and we were collecting our mail after being on the road for six months and uh, he had a residual check and he opened it and he had spent three days on a Harrison Ford movie and he had like a $4,000 check, which was more than I had saved for the entire run of doing the theater. And he was like, yeah, oh my God. 
and I realized, oh, and I had like, I opened like my student loans, right? And I realized, oh, I'm gonna need to do some TV and film if I ever wanna buy a house, Adam. Wait, why are you blaming me? I didn't keep you from buying a house. Sorry. I didn't choose theater for you. Misplaced anger, I'm so sorry. Yeah. This is not Wharton's fault, let's I just be clear. I thought you were a therapist. Not that kind of psychologist, I'm really sorry. I'm useless to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so when, when did you get the call? So then, you know, long story short, I really struggled in New York. Um, I could never get anything going. I always like to say this. Um, I was the only actor in New York who never even auditioned for Law & Order. <laughs> now, Law & Order, as you know, every single episode of Law & Order uh, has seven or eight people that are like, loading boxes or washing glasses <laughs> or mopping a floor going like, oh, I've, I've seen him here before, but I haven't seen him around in a while. <laughs> and then I didn't even get an audition to do to the guy to do this. I didn't even get rejected from that because I couldn't even get the audition. That's how low on the acting totem pole I was. But I took this comedy show that my friends and I had created in New York, um, which we called a slacker vaudeville. And it was these weird clowns in this kind of surrealist Pee Wee Herman landscape and uh, doing sketch comedy. And we brought it to LA in 1999 and I moved there. And then a lot of doors started opening and then I started slogging along in the world of uh, television and film. And after a nice uh, run on uh, six Feet Under, which was on HBO at the time. And at the time, HBO was really reinventing television, Sopranos and Entourage, Sex and the City, The Wire. They were all on at the same time. And that just opened a ton of doors for me. And uh, it's been uh, an incredible ride ever since. Yeah, it has. OK, so tell us about your office audition. How did that happen? You know, I. I knew the, uh, I, w I had been cast in another TV show. I was cast in a show with Janine Garofalo. And I was going to do the table read for Janine Garofalo and I had my plane ticket and I was flying to Vancouver to go start shooting the next day. And we, I was going through Universal and there was a TV executive that I knew and I was like, oh, hi. And he was like, oh, I'm so excited. We just got the rights to the British office to make the American version. And I had my little script of this really pretty bad Janine Garofalo pilot. And I was like, oh, that's great. Congratulations. So, oh, and inside I was kicking myself because I loved the English office. So we had the table read and um, it went terribly. And I got home and I got a call and they said they canceled the show. Tear up your plane ticket. They're still going to pay you, by the way. And, um, and, and you're free and they're not, they're not gonna do the pilot. And I was like, yes! So I picked up the phone, like, hey, they're doing this office. And I was literally the first actor in on the very first day of auditions. And um, the, the ca casting director, Allison Jones, I had known through the grapevine, and I auditioned for both Dwight and Michael. Um, what? Yes. And... Mine's just exploded. My, my <laughs> Michael audition was terrible. It was, I just, I was such a huge Ricky Gervais fan. I just was doing a Ricky Gervais imitation. I was like, so I'm the world's best boss. And, uh, you know, I was just doing a lot of <laughs> mannerisms. It was just <laughs> awful. But really when it came to Dwight, I was like, you know, I, I know this, I know this guy. And it was, <laughs> it was, it was one of those cases where I was like, there re there's really no one else that can play this role. Like I, I know exactly who this guy is. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons with guys like this. <laughs> I, I literally played uh, Dungeons and Dragons with a guy named Chris Cole, if you're listening, Chris. Uh, Chris Cole had Battlestar Galactica glasses. <laughs> I'm not making this up. It said Battlestar Galactica because it had just come out in the late 70s and they had he had wire-rimmed Battlestar Galactica glasses, and we would mock him mercilessly, like, oh, Chris, do they shoot lasers? Pew, pew, pew. And he would always, when he played, he was skinny as a rail, 97 pounds, 
and he would always, his D&D characters would always be these giant warriors, and, <laughs> and he would draw them with giant <laughs> mu rippling muscles, and then he joined the army to play coronet in the army marching band. So, oh, and he studied fencing. So, I thank you, Chris, because although that is not Dwight Schrute, like, that is, the, the people in suburban Seattle that I hung with were absolutely cut from Schrutean cloth, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Okay, so, I, I have to ask, did Chris eat beets? I'm, I don't think he probably ate beets. He probably, I think he only ate McDonald's, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you got the part? Yes. You become Dwight? Yes. Tell us what it was like to be on that show. Well, um, I don't have a lot to compare it to because I hadn't really been a series regular on a lot of other shows. But I'll tell you, uh, the thing that I've since learned uh, is how exceptionally collaborative it was as a set. So as Dunder Mifflin was not collaborative whatsoever, um, the office was completely collaborative. So as long as we got the lines as scripted and got them well, we could say whatever the hell we wanted. And if, if we wanted to take a scene in a different direction, we would try it. Because that's one of the uh, amazing things about it having to be documentary is that we just had two guys with cameras and they were just, just talk and do stuff and they were just doing this all the time. And, you know, so if you want to go skip over here or start wrestling or this, that, you know, they're going to they're gonna capture it. So that uh, method, that system of... Uh, of uh, you know, the, the foundation of the show, of the documentary, allowed for so, so much comedic freedom. Because if, you're, if you are uh, highly choreographed, you can't go off like that. Even like on Friends or a Seinfeld set, you know, you have the camera moves and it's kind of blocked. And you can't just kind of start improvising or doing physical comedy on the side. So it was... Um, Wonderfully collaborative. Greg Daniels, the, the, the showrunner, was um, incredibly open to ideas. He would have two different cuts of a scene, and he wouldn't know which one to do. And so he would ask the janitorial staff and the guy, the security guard, and the people doing craft services, and he would bring them all into the editing room, and he would show them the two scenes, and they would vote, and he would pick, he would pick that one. There's very few people, trust me, in Hollywood that work in that way. So he didn't have an ego about it. And, um, uh, and it was, and, and that generated a, a good feeling in the, in the cast that was uh, pretty astonishing. I remember we had a director who came in who had just come from directing a show that shall not be named, <laughs> Desperate Housewives. And, <laughs> and he said, oh my God. First of all, no one on that show is even talking to each other. And they wait in their trailers until they absolutely have to come out, and many of them won't do scenes together. But you guys not only, you know, six years in, talk to each other like you love each other. You come in, you hug, you high five, you laugh. And um, so it was, and we kind of all, as we were shooting it, we were all kind of new, like, you know what, this is probably going to be the best job we ever have, you know, hands down. I want to talk more about that. Uh, I think, I don't remember when it was. It must have been 10 or 12 years ago. I was on an airplane and somebody asked me what I did. And I said, professor, and it looked like they were going to try to change seats. <laughs> and then the next time somebody asked me that question, I said, psychologist, and I got the same reaction. Okay. And over time, I thought, okay, what's, what's a more interesting way to describe organizational psychology? I study how to make work not suck. And nobody tried to move away when I said that. And I, I have to say that like, The Office is a show about work sucking to the max. Um, I, I think I've shown more Office clips in my classes at Wharton than all other movie and TV clips combined. Nice. And I'm curious about what you learned. It sounds like there was quite a contrast between um, the dynamic you had on the show and then the, the Office you were creating at Dunder Mifflin. But what did you learn about making work better and creating good jobs? Well, one of the things that was astonishing to us in making The Office was how popular it was with high school and college kids who had never set foot in an office. <laughs> we thought we were making a show for, for work 
folk in their 20s and 30s that had a, had a, a jerk boss and had you know, office romances and struggles in the office. And that's what we thought we were making the, the, the show for. And then all of a sudden, we were like the number one show among teenagers. And we're like, this is, this is crazy. They've never been in, a, in, a, in an office building before. Um, but the other thing that's pretty nuts is I cannot tell you how many times I've seen written online or people have actually told me that they longed to work in a place like Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> and I think they're very, uh, they're getting confused. The, I have so many questions. The, <laughs> the, the spirit of the show, the heart of the show, the, the love by, for, and in between the characters that's revealed in the show, the vulnerabilities um, are what people fall in love with. And they mistake that for being a kind of a really uh, lifeless corporate drone uh, in, a, in a paper company. Because first of all, this whole idea of like, it's the worst kind of hierarchy patriarchy of like the boss who kind of knows it all and you're, you're, you're a captive audience. You can't flee their jokes or their whims. So that feels very like 1950s kind of. Um, and the, the kind of the drudgery of the nine to five and everyone is in their little box. There's so many things about it that, that feel timeless and yet completely outdated. I would agree. Um, I, yeah, I, if you were going into Dunder Mifflin, if Jan hired you, said, <laughs> Michael, we've got uh, occupational psychologist Adam Grant here, conference room, five minutes. And uh, Adam Grant went in the conference room with Michael and Dwight and Jim and Pam and, and Ryan and the whole gang. And what would you be working on at Dunder Mifflin? Wow. <laughs> the, I think this, this is the coolest day in my job ever. <laughs> like, yes, I, sign me up for that. That's um, your next book, by the way. Um, yes, I would totally do that. Um, can we play this out for a second? Do it. OK, um, can you be Dwight? For you, for you, I will. Wow, he wasn't kidding. Play this out. <laughs> Mr. Shoot? Shroot. Shroot, I'm sorry. Hi, um, Adam Grant. Nice to meet you. I understand you're the uh, assistant regional, ma regional manager, is that right? That's correct. Um, tell me what you think is wrong with this place, Dunder Mifflin. Let me start at the beginning. Everything. <laughs> I think there is a, a, an incredible amount of dead wood. Here's my list of who should be fired by this afternoon. I'm happy to take on the task. Hmm. Um, I noticed your list says Jim, 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 and Jim. Yes. Uh, what, what's your beef with Jim? I don't have a beef with Jim. He's terrible. He's an idiot, he's stupid, and he's ugly. Okay, so I get that it might not be ideal to work with an idiot who's stupid. The ugly part, Jim does a lot of phone sales. So not really sure how that's relevant to his job. Can you help me make sense of that? He is uh, nauseating the rest of the office because we have to look at him and we have to, you try and work with that, okay? It's like working with a leper. Wow. Okay, so if I gave him his own office where you didn't have to look at him all day. You can would... transfer him to the Stanford or Utica branch. All right, interesting. Um, what does Jim's sales performance look like? Can I have a raise? <laughs> what have you done to earn a raise? I am a tireless worker, and I close every sale, and I answer the phone no matter the time of day. That's interesting. I've, I've actually heard all those, those things I've about I've also you. had your car detailed as we've been having this conversation. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Um, I don't think I authorized that, but, and I'm a little creeped out right now that you did that, but I, I appreciate the sentiment and the dedication. Um, I found $2.17 in the various ashtrays. You're welcome. You can have them if you want them. Wow. Um, thank you. I, I will say... How much longer is this improv going to go on? <laughs> 
I do, I do have to ask you a question, Mr. Schrute, which is, I, I've heard you're incredibly dedicated. Uh, you're conscientious to the max. You scored off the charts on our assessment of industriousness and diligence and grit. Um, Angela Duckworth actually vouched for your grit personally. Good. I have beautiful grit. We did get some feedback that you don't always play well with others, and sometimes you even stop people from doing their jobs. That's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous, too. I, Ridiculously you know true. Really? Yes, because their incompetence is nauseating. Okay, I'll tell you what. So, it sounds like you want to race. You asked for that. Yes. I hear you also want a promotion. Yes. If I give you a list of ways that you can make other people better and then offered you a raise and promotion if you hit those targets, how would you feel about that? I feel... Uh, does not compute. <laughs> and scene. And scene. It's good. He's good. Okay, so what... What, what you've, you've worked on now, you've worked on a lot of projects. You've worked with a lot of people. Um, my goal was to try to figure out what motivated Dwight Schrute and then connect what I cared about to Dwight's motives. How well did I do? You scored off the charts. That was amazing. That was absolutely incredible. Yeah. Why, thank you. How would you have done that with Michael? <laughs> well, are you going to give us your mic? No, we don't have to play it out. <laughs> um, I think, I don't know, my read of Michael was that uh, he's actually not a bad guy, but he really wants to be famous. And his antics are in front of the camera, and so I would try to get him off camera would be my first thought. My second thought would be to help him see that becoming a famous hated boss is probably not the ideal place to land. Well, I think he was famous before the cameras were there, putting on a live show for the audience, and then the cameras just threw kerosene on the fire. Is that true? I think so. Yeah. Interesting. So I think if you had showed up at Dunder Mifflin six months before with no cameras and just like scouted around, you would have seen Michael Scott like, hey, fella, so, uh, you know, he would have been putting on a show yeah. right in the so office. So he just had a bigger audience now. Yeah, just a bigger audience, yeah. Yeah, I'd want to hold up a mirror and have him seen how, see how disliked he is. And then the hope is he wants to be loved. Yes. Although I, I remember him also saying he wants people to fear him and love him and he wants them to be afraid of how much they love him. That's true. <laughs> That's very good. I, You've seen the show. Once or twice. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about a bunch of other things. Um, but before we temporarily leave the office, uh, I, I had two questions about your experience on the show. One is you achieved success a lot later in life than many people in your industry do. How old were you when you were cast as Dwight? I was 38 when I was cast as Dwight. And I had a peculiar baby face. So uh, I appeared younger, <laughs> but I was older. But by the time the office was really kind of off and running, I was in my early 40s. So, I mean, one of the great things about Dwight is you can't really put your finger on how old he is. Sometimes he seems like he's 25, and sometimes <laughs> he seems like he's 45. So it's just kind of this general area. But yeah, it was very interesting for me to achieve fame kind of in my 40s after a long, long slog of trying to pay my bills and be a professional actor. It's such an interesting contrast to a dynamic that I think a lot of people watch, which is the opposite of somebody gets too much success too soon. It goes to their head. Yeah. Um, they end up with a giant, fragile ego. They lack humility. They end up becoming more takers than givers. There's a, there's a whole syndrome that I'm sure you've, you've watched a lot sure. of people fall mm -hmm. victim to. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is your version of that? Because That's what happened to John and Jenna and Mindy and <laughs> BJ and... No, I'm kidding. No, but I, you know, I am struck. We've, we've known each other for a few years now, although we've, we haven't met in person until now. And I, I'm just blown away by how down to earth you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you don't have 19 handlers. Um, you like, book your own flights, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, like, is, this, is this who you are? Is this your character? Is this a function of the late stage at which you achieved your success? Well, you know, we're going to be getting to the book and to the TV show the geography of bliss later on. But it's something I've talked about a little bit recently and has been blown completely out of proportion. But that is, and I talked about how at times, not all the time, at times, I was very, very unhappy while doing The Office. So 
here it is. It showed, by the way, on camera in certain scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Dwight is really pissed off today. Go on. <laughs> but here I am in a job that is beyond my wildest dreams. Here I am, you know, making millions of dollars, making people laugh in a show that's being, I'm being nominated for Emmys. Um, movies are being offered to me, development deals, all kinds of amazing opportunities that if you had fast cut back to six years before, it's me not even be, being able to get the law and order a janitor audition, let alone the job. So it was an incredible uh, transformation in my life. And it, it did go to my head and it did, um, there were a, a lot of times when I was really wrestling with my ego and uh, when I was very unhappy because it wasn't enough. And it goes to that kind of essential human not enoughness that we're often dealing with, where we can't just 100% and absolutely be in total kind of grace and gratitude for the gifts that we have that are right in front of us. But we're always in this yearn, yearning and longing for the thing that's just outside of our grasp. In this case, like, why didn't my movies work? Why didn't I get offered better movies? Why didn't I get this other development deal? Why didn't I get more money for this? Why, you know, um, uh, why didn't I win an Emmy? Why did Jeremy Piven win the Emmy, for Christ's sakes? <laughs> uh, I can't answer that question. <laughs> but this, this is part of kind of the spiritual conundrum. And, you know, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, and the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha, came to America about 100 years ago. And I, there's a story I love because he landed in America. He was going to do a speaking tour, essentially, kind of like an Adam Grant does. And, uh, and a reporter said, hey, do Baha'is believe in Satan? And Abdul Baha said, yes, they do. And the reporter's like, oh, what is Satan to a Baha'i. And Abdul Baha said, the insistent self. So I love that idea that Satan is not some boogeyman creature with red scales or something like that, but that we have this battle within us. It, is, it really is the inner jihad, the, the battle against ourselves. Against, and this is in every faith tradition in the world. But I, I came up against that hard during the office, and it was, just ask my wife, it was some very difficult times, and, um, uh, and I had to do a lot of soul searching during that time, and, uh, and therapy and whatnot to kind of come out on the other side of that. And, and, and I, I, I was in a conversation like this with B.J. Novak at the 92nd Street Y a few months back, and we, we came to the same agreement. Our one regret, our one regret was that we just didn't enjoy it more. And that might be a life lesson for every single person here to just enjoy it more. I, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of startling to hear because this is, this is as good as it ever gets yes. for an actor. I mean, you, 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 I'm, I'm sure you've thought many times, no matter how successful I become at anything I do in the future, there will never be another office. Absolutely true. And you didn't enjoy that as much as you wished. I didn't, no. I wasn't in the present moment. And, um, you know, we talked about, there's some concepts on Buddhism, because in, in Soul Boom, I, talk, uh, I draw on a number of different faith traditions, but in Buddhism, there's a concept of the hungry ghost. And in kind of Buddhist practice, we are, our culture are a bunch of, we're a few billion hungry ghosts on the planet. And the hungry ghost is someone who has died who has li is living in craving, living in constant craving, and is constantly unsatisfied. So in the death realm, they're reaching, craving, longing for, grasping. And you, you just described everyone's worst stereotype of Wharton. <laughs> well, I think it's very relevant to people that are pursuing a career in business because why, you know, is it <laughs> like, <laughs> Why the hell, why the hell did you not get into Princeton? <laughs> they don't have a business school, obviously. Um, but, but truthfully, like, you know, why, why business? Is it to make money, to achieve fame, to have control, to have high status? Um, uh, no, because I know I don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer. 
So what's left where I can still seem educated? Yeah, <laughs> nice, nice. But I think, I think these questions, I think these spiritual questions are very relevant no matter what your career path, but especially to, to people that are seeking to you know, change things and shake things up through entrepreneurship. I think it's, I think it's important conversation to have. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I, I want to talk, let's talk about Soul Boom a little bit because um, I, was, I was floored by this book. Um, I expected it to be funny. It is. I didn't know it was going to be this deep and this broad. Um, I, I feel like you're delivering a message that could not be both more timeless but also more timely um, for a generation that's about to enter the workforce or re-enter the workforce. And I think, I guess one of the, the thoughts that I was left with as, um, as I was reading the book uh, last spring, actually it was before then, I think it was um, probably last fall or early winter. Yeah. Um, when, when I read the book and then thinking about the conversation today, I was thinking, I, I've been teaching here for 15 years. I have a lot of conversations with students who feel like there's a gap, there's a gaping hole in their life around purpose or meaning. Mm -hmm. And they've filled it with ambition. Mm -hmm. And that sounds a lot like the hungry ghost that you're talking about. So um, talk to us a little bit about your case that we need not a religious revolution, but a spiritual revolution. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Um, and I really relate to that, by the way. I think that in order to really make it as an actor in show business, you have to be incredibly driven and you have to be incredibly ambitious. There's a lot of things you need. You need that coupled with, with talent and a lot of luck. Um, but yeah, I, I can relate like that hungry ghost phase that I went through when I was on the office was really one driven by kind of like a, an, an un, unending ambition. So, uh, but I think one of the things that I'm most grateful for in my life is uh, the mental health crises that I've undergone in my life. Did you just say you were grateful for having grateful had for mental that. health crises? Yes, I am. Can you and, unpack that for us? Sure. So one of, when you turn to the teachings of the Buddha, uh, his number one rule of the four noble truths is life is suffering. When the Buddha used the word suffering, the translation, the original word in Pali Sanskrit is dukkha. And dukkha means kind of um, anxious discontent, right? So life is anxious discontent. And maybe some of you can see some heads nodding, have felt some anxious discontent in their lives. Why aren't things the way that I want them to be? Why, why can't it be more like this? I want this outcome. And why does this person keep acting this way? And how come I didn't get what I wanted? And we live our lives with those gears grinding. We're wired to do that as human beings because it's what's kept us alive for hundreds of thousands of years. That anxiety, you know, ensured that we had enough, you know, deer jerky stored in our cave and enough, you know, fuel and wood to get us through the winter and that the rustling in the leaves and the bush outside of our cave wasn't some uh, bear that was going to devour our face. So um, anxious discontent keeps us on the balls of our toes and keeps us alive. But how does it, how does it come to play in the modern world? So for me, um, in my 20s, when I was struggling as an actor, trying to get a, an audition for Law & Order, uh, I, I suffered a lot of anxiety and depression and addiction issues, loneliness. And, and again, through, the, through that, trying to substitute purpose and meaning and vision for ambition, thinking that the next big job, ah, oh, once I get this next big acting gig, then, I'm going to feel content. Then I'm going to feel at peace. And it's always just outside of my grasp. And then I get it, that big movie and it doesn't do well. Oh, I need the next big movie. I need the next big thing. And you can apply this to any career that one wants to undertake. But what it forced me to do, these mental health issues, was to get a lot of therapy and to do a lot of soul searching, a lot of meditation and praying, and a lot of reading of the world's holy writings. And I felt, I feel like that work that I've done on the, in the spiritual side of being a human being and my spiritual reality has brought me great peace and vision and mission and purpose that can feed my creative life and also help me to like write a book and spread the word and also talk to young people about this most great 
crises that's happening right now. There's two great ones. There's climate change, maybe we'll get to that later, but the mental health crisis that's affecting young people and destroying young people and tearing their lives apart is something that spirituality does hold some answers to. So without me suffering, um, I never would have been driven to read and explore these issues that I've written about that I would never have allowed me to transformed from a hungry ghost into the incredibly handsome international <laughs> talent you see sitting before you. <laughs> I love that. Um, you, you, as you were describing your, your experience, I was thinking about what Tal Ben-Shahar calls the arrival fallacy. Uh, the, oh. the misguided belief that once I get yeah. this job or this recognition or once I fall in love and get married or once I have kids, fill in your once, that everything will be different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Hemingway put it best when he said, you can't get away from yourself by moving from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think your book really speaks to this in you spend a lot of time on inner work um, and sort of walking us through what you learned spiritually that helped with your mental health. Um, I'd love to know what, what came out of that. Um, and I think our audience is probably curious about that too. Yeah, I think, first of all, uh, one of my favorite quotes that I, I throw around a lot is um, from Father Tehart de Chardin, a Jesuit priest, and he says, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And as deceptively simple as that phrase is, for me, that means a tremendous amount. And the understanding that I am, in essence, a spiritual being, and I get 80 or 90 or 100 years, I hope, in this magnificent fleshy tuxedo <laughs> running around, um, <laughs> is, to me, puts everything into crystalline clarity. And like, oh, every day is a kind of spiritual test Every day is a, uh, a spiritual obstacle course uh, where I'm going to be beset with things that are going to make me impatient or frustrated or feeling less than. And I get to use spiritual tools uh, to help me combat this, you know, what, what's coming at me. I, I, I talk about TV in here and I talk about the show uh, Kung Fu from the 1970s. And just long story, super short, Kwai Chang Kane is a Shaolin priest who studies Buddhism and Taoism and Kung Fu, and he goes to the Old West, and he's always being attacked by racist cowboys. That's the show in a nutshell. And occasionally he kicks ass. So, but that, I talk about that television show as being like akin to our spiritual path that we walk. That's a, our internal spiritual path that we walk. So... There are so many, I know you've also worked a lot in positive psychology, and there are so many tools from positive psychology that are essentially spiritual tools, like gratitude is, is a great one. Um, and, you know, meditation is uh, a, a tool that works on so many different levels. So I have a daily meditation practice. And one of the things that meditation does is it, it allows you metacognition. And um, as Arthur Brooks writes about in his new book, this idea that when, you're, when I'm in a meditative state, I, there's a part of me that gets to like float above and look down at my thoughts and go, oh, I'm not my thoughts. And there's part of me that gets to look down and, and have feelings. I'm like, oh, I'm not my feelings. I can let my thoughts go, and my feelings go. My reality is greater than my thoughts and my feelings and certainly greater than my body. And so that's a very simple spiritual tool that exists in every faith tradition. Contemplation exists in every faith tradition that is something that can be harnessed to make your life better. So I've, I'm on the record as being a little bit of a meditation skeptic. Okay. And I'm not skeptical of the evidence that you know, it can lead to mindfulness, um, that it can reduce stress. Um, I think I'm skeptical because I don't think it's one size fits all. And I, I, for example, I've never had trouble separating my thoughts and feelings from my identity. Um, I don't have a monkey mind. Like, I'm like, wait, you, you hear voices in your head? Like, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was a thing. Like, my, my head is quiet, unless I'm deliberately having a thought. And so when people try to sell me on meditation, I'm like, I don't need that. Like, no. the, 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 you're solving problems for me that I don't experience. I think the way that you just articulated metacognition is really compelling. Um, and I think... 
Well, I want to say something about yeah, that. Please do. Um, so I'm the opposite. I wake up in the morning, I look at a couple of emails and make my uh, half-calf latte and my head is a beehive. So it's just <laughs> I need a practice to help me gain kind of perspective. And I will also say that I have this beautiful little bench out in our backyard that's gorgeous. We have an olive tree and some flowers and there's tons of hummingbirds out there because um, we live in LA. And uh, the, uh, and sometimes I'm trying to meditate. I just can't meditate for shit. And so I'm just like, I just turn and I just witness the beauty and majesty and wonder of the hummingbirds and the leaves and the trees and the wind and the light through the leaves. And uh, Anne Lamott uh, has a great book called Help, Thanks, Wow. And those are the three prayers that you say. You say, help, you know, God, help me. Thanks, thank you, God, gratitude, and wow. And then I just try and live in the wow. And if you can live in the wow for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just like, this is fucking great, man. <laughs> Listen to those birds. I didn't know hummingbirds chirped. Wow. Like, if you can live in that, it, uh, to me, it helps my day tremendously. I, can, I could be, I could take a, a, a data-driven test, you know, on, a, on, a, on one of your websites and... Man after my own heart. And, yes. and find a, you know, a 12.5% a increase in well-being over the course of that day when I had lived in wonder. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think... One, one of the places that I got worried was, you've probably seen there have been a few papers showing that even when people do transcendental or loving kindness meditation, sometimes they come out more self-focused. It's about, it's like, I want to be more loving. I'm going to be kinder. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be more generous. How do you think about making sure that whatever reflective or contemplative practice you do isn't self-centered? Well, I think that's a problem with how spirituality is viewed in contemporary society, because Spirituality, um, uh, we have jettisoned uh, religion for the large part in the kind of more secular materialist West, the, the blue states, the coasts, whatever, Western civilization, that part of Western civilization. And as I say in the book, sometimes we've thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater. So we've jettisoned religion and then we've lost something from that. But really, spirituality has become commodified and has fit into our kind of capitalist way of doing things where it's like, I'm really anxious, I'm out of balance, I'm angry all the time, I'm lost, I'm lonely, um, I'm depressed. Let me download this app and subscribe to this mindfulness app. Let me download this Eckhart Tolle podcast. Let me subscribe to this roomy quote of the day on Instagram. Let me go to my yoga class down. And, and I'm doing all this so that I can reduce my anxiety. So there's, it's a transactional nature. I'm going to spend this money and I'm going to invest this time so that I feel better. So it really pisses me off that spirituality, which is all about connecting with the mystic, divine, beautiful purpose of the universe in, in, in service and in community and in transcendence with others, has been commodified to such an extent that it becomes this selfish act of like, I want my life to be better. I'm going to buy this thing because I want my life to be better. I'm going to do spirituality because I want my life to be better. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting your life to be better, of course. But at its heart, you talked about loving kindness meditation. Of course, the happiest man ever recorded on brain scans was doing so. Um, Ricard, it was his Matthew last Ricard. Yeah, yeah, Matthew Ricard. Yeah, Matthew Ricard. Yeah. In, in Wisconsin doing a loving kindness meditation. And of course, the idea of a loving kindness meditation is compassion for others. And that's what the golden rule, which exists in every faith tradition is about. It's about understanding, deeply connecting with the suffering of others and the plight of others. And that is the most spiritual act that can possibly be if it's coupled then with service to others. Mm -hmm. That was a great screed against mindfulness, uh, exactly what the world needs. I think, so if you think about the, the void of spirituality, the sense of purpose and transcendence that a lot of people are looking for in life, 
Um, I remember Derek, uh, Derek Thompson wrote a great Atlantic article a few years ago on workism, where he mm. said that, that work has taken the place that religion and faith and spirituality traditions used to hold in our society. Mm. Um, you know, I, thought, I read the article and I thought, yeah, I, I teach a lot of students who, um, who pray to the high priest of hustle um, and who worship at the altar of status. Yeah. And um, I don't, like you were saying earlier, I don't think we should, tr we should strive to strip work of its meaning. Um, I, I want people to have meaningful, worthwhile jobs. Um, but there is a sense in which this gets blown up or reified um, and work becomes too important as a, a part of somebody's identity and their contribution to the world. And I wonder how you've, I guess, how you've navigated that. So with this perspective that you bring to the table, how do you think about your work being meaningful but not the most important thing on earth? Um, that was a really long question. No, I, I, love, I love that question. How do I, how do I want to get into that? You know. I had this incredible acting teacher uh, named Zelda Fitchhandler, and she founded the Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., just down the hill over there. And um, she taught me at NYU. And when she taught actors, she always talked about the shaman. And I always loved that, that she compared actors to shaman. Now, shaman, we really don't know what the hell they did. But shaman exists in some way, shape, or form in every culture in the world. It doesn't matter what continent, what era. Someone that was a storyteller, uh, a singer, uh, a stand-up comedian, a mystic, a priest, um, someone who kept the myths alive and told stories of the ancestors, sang songs or stories of the day's hunt, you know, danced and entertained, cajoled. And I love this idea of actor as shaman. It sounds a little self-important, but what it does is then it elevates being an actor. To, I'm not just someone who memorizes lines and tries to make them sound convincing. Um, I'm someone that gets to play all kinds of roles in theater, in film, in, in, in TV, uh, in, in spoken word, gets to use language and, and tell stories that help shape our culture and I was really fortunate with The Office because those genius writers wrote the words that I got to use to help shape culture. I remember when we were, I was talking to Greg Daniels early on, I'm like, what do you hope to do with The Office? And he goes, you know, American comedy is really bad right now. And I just want to take, I want to, I want to move American comedy like one degree in the right direction. It's like, it's like steering the Titanic, you know? <laughs> you have to move it by one degree and then it ends up going in the right direction. And guess what, he succeeded. More than a degree, you reinvented American comedy. Amazing. So as, a, as I allowed myself more and more to be a shaman, I'm like, oh, you know, I've got a platform because I'm an actor. I'll write this dumb book about spirituality and God and souls and the meaning of life. Maybe some young people will read it and respond to it. Maybe not. I do work in climate change. We do climate change storytelling. Um, I try and do, you know, be a part of projects that you know, address mental health issues, and um, that's really exciting to me and, and jazzes me. So I forget what the question was, but the answer is shaman. It's a good answer, um, and I think every shaman today has a podcast. And I'm going to be starting one, too. We were waiting for that yes. news. Um, so let, let's talk about the extensions of Soul Boom um, into some of the other work that you're doing. So. Uh, I remember, gosh, I, I might have even been in college when I read The Geography of Bliss and thought it was an ingenious look from a grump's perspective at uh, what might actually drive happiness. I was overjoyed when I found out that there was going to be a TV show that you were going to host, yeah. trying to find the world's happiest place. Yeah. So you've scoured the world for happiness secrets. What have you learned? So we got to make uh, five episodes for the Pe Peacock uh, Network uh, based on Eric Weiner's book, uh, The Geography of Bliss. And we got to go to um, Iceland, one of the world's happiest places. Uh, Bulgaria, one of the world's unhappiest places. Uh, Ghana, West Africa, one of the most optimistic places in the world. Thailand, one of the most kind of spiritually connected places. And then I got to bring it back home to Los Angeles, which is a god-awful cultureless <laughs> void. Um, <laughs> to try and bring what I've learned back home. Although there are a lot of hummingbirds. Too many freaking hummingbirds, if you ask me. You gotta do something about that. Um, what eats hummingbirds? 
I, I feel like your alter ego would know the answer to this. Yes. That needs to be an app, like Ask Dwight, like Chat GPT. <laughs> I like, think a Dwight GPT would be a big hit. Dwight GPT would be idiot hawks. <laughs> uh, so you went to five places. Five places, and you know, it, 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 it's amazing. I, um, in the book, I reference the Grant study from Harvard University, which I'm sure you know tons about. But this idea that, you know, and they followed these 300 men for like 80 years to find what made them have a good life. And it all boiled down to essentially connections and having better, deeper, richer, more frequent connections. And guess what? We live in a time of increasing isolation when we're all doing this all day um, and, and connecting less and less. Um, and that's really what I learned out on the road. Like it's all, and it was so beautiful to see whether it was, you know, these beautiful Valkyrie Viking women in Iceland singing and holding hands and walking, doing a cold plunge into the Arctic Ocean, whether it was a communal, you know, uh, I don't want to say tribe of people, but family group of people in Ghana growing cocoa beans and collaborating together and trying to kind of uplift their community. Whether it's in Thailand where people spend their birthday not receiving presents, but on their birthday giving to others. They spend their birthday going and feeding the poor and tending to the the monks and monasteries and temples and giving of their time, which I thought was a wonderful inverse. And in Los Angeles, where everyone has a podcast, um, but it, again, it really was just about uh, these beautiful ways that humans connect and how that's where the work lies. The work lies in just bringing people together and um, and in unique ways, creating bonds of love and unity and community and social change based in grassroots movements of loving people working together. I, I love this idea of, of turning your birthday into giving as opposed mm. to getting. Um, I'm also struck as, as you talk about um, the Iceland experience, um, Durkheim called it collective effervescence, the idea that we're gonna be um, immersed in a group with shared energy around a common purpose. Hmm. Um, hmm. And he described that as, as the most transcendent experience that people have. Uh, we were at the Eagles game on Sunday, and uh, there was an amazing A.J. Brown touchdown. And the whole stadium erupted, and we were like, there was a, a, a huge guy high-fiving our son. And I was like, I don't know that I like this situation. But, but it was an amazing moment where the whole, the whole stadium was aligned around this common purpose. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I don't have that in my life other than going to a sporting event. Hmm. Like we feel that at the family level, but the community level, that's gone. Hmm. Is there anything you saw in Iceland or Ghana or anywhere else you traveled that you think America ought to import? Well, I, I can't speak specifically to those geographical locations, but I think you put your finger on something really important to something that I referenced earlier, which is we've thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater. Religion has caused untold suffering and some of the most grotesque uh, actions and behaviors in human history, and we're very right to, to question it and to challenge it. That being said, religion is exactly what you're talking about. Religion, and in fact, Gautam Chopra, Deepak Chopra's son, who's a TV producer, has a production company called Religion of Sports. And he wrote a book about the fact that sports has become the new religion of the modern man. There, there are temples and celebrations, there's mass singing, there's communion and celebration and gratitude and, and bonding. But that's what a religion, I believe, can give folks at its best, is a group of common folks coming together, seeking transcendence, seeking communion, seeking connection with nature, with God, with eternity, uh, living, especially if they're doing service to others and serving the poor and coming together to, to give of their time and their energy and their schedule and their status to serve other people. And, uh, and th this is, and you know, I have in Soul Boom, I have a chapter called, Hey Kids, Let's Build the Perfect Religion, 
where we build the soul boom religion, which takes the best aspects of all of the different religions of the, of the world's faith traditions and wisdom traditions and puts them into one big jambalaya. And I do think that um, humanity is, is missing something by uh, having lost its, that transcendent need to commune in community. Let's put the commune back in community. Well put. I think it's time for a lightning round. Okay. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, here are the rules. Uh, we're looking for a word or a sentence, no more. Okay. You can pass once if you need to. Okay. All right, here we go. Pass. <laughs> You're fired. Um, okay, first question, what kind of bear is best? Uh, sun bear, Tibetan sun bear. Uh, favorite office episode? Uh, the injury. Favorite office character other than Dwight? Creed. Wildly unpopular choice. Um, favorite Jim prank on Dwight? Oh, um, putting the desk in the bathroom. Oh, classic. I, I thought you were going to go for when the phone was full of nickels and then you slammed yourself in yes, the Yes, that's the, that's the psychology one because that was based in, uh, in uh, yeah, Pavlovian, Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, theory. Yeah. That's why I loved it most. Okay. Um, your best. Uh, I like the one in the bathroom because there's a poop joke. <laughs> when Kevin flushes the toilet and walks out of the stall, and then Dwight has to answer the phone. <laughs> you can imagine what it smelled like in there. <laughs> your favorite um, scene that you improvised on The Office? Uh, the scene where uh, Michael had two Michael heads, and I was dressed as a Sith Lord, and we were having a conversation in Halloween about firing Dwight. And, and I was like, don't fire Dwight. Yeah, should I? I don't know. That was all improvised. <laughs> We'd have to rewatch that. What is the Dwight attribute that's most like you? Uh, uh, sees the world in an offbeat, odd, fractured way. And his trait that's least like you? Uh, bullying. Touche. Uh, what's the worst advice you've ever gotten? Pass. <laughs> I'll come back to that one. Something you've rethought lately. Um, I've rethought uh, assault weapons bans uh, due to Malcolm history. Gladwell's exploration of that particular issue around gun control on his podcast. Me too. It was a great episode. Um, okay, this, this one, I have to say, comes from a student. I'm not going to name them. Question is, what's your chess.com username, and can I add you slash play against you? I'm not going to tell you, um, but if you text uh, Mr. Grant, then I, he will, uh, Professor Grant will give it to you. Hmm. Yes. All right. And I'm going to get that later. Ass. Is that a threat? No. And chess. Not in real life. Do you play chess? I do. Let's do it. What's your rating? I don't have one. I, on, I only play analog. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go. Game on. Let's do this. This is going to be fun. We'll report back. Uh, okay, here's another student one that I thought was hilarious. As a person born and raised in Scranton, Pennsylvania, I have to ask, how much time have you actually spent in Scranton, Pennsylvania? So one of the, my favorite events that ever happened in my life, The Office had just started, I think season one, and no one watched season one when it was first out. I got a call, and they were like, they want to pay you an extraordinary amount of money. I think it was like $20,000 to fly to Scranton and sign autographs and help open this mall, the Steamtown Mall. <laughs> and I was like, okay, remember, I'm 40 years old, I've been broke my whole life trying to make it as an actor, and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Um, so I land at the Scranton Airport, the mayor's entourage picks me up with a full retinue of police cars and a limousine and full sirens and the mayor is like, come on in. I get in the mayor's limo, <laughs> rushing through Scranton. They take me to a town city hall meeting. I meet everyone there, because this is the first time in American history that Scranton has been put on the map. And they are weeping with gratitude. And this guy is like, he, he's like, hey, will you help me propose to my wife? And I'm like, OK. And at the town council meeting, and they're giving me the official, like, Sheriffs, they're making me an honorary Lackawanna County Sheriff, and they're giving me the key to the city, and then he brings up this 
girl and he's like, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And then I bring them together and we're photographed for like the Scranton J J News <laughs> Sentinel. And then I go to the, the mall and the line is stretching around the mall and down the block. There's tens of thousands of people waiting to get in to see me of Scrantonites. And they, <laughs> they foolishly give me uh, what they call in the business a God mic. Like it's a microphone that echoes through the whole mall. So there's thousands, I can't possibly get to all the people and sign the pictures and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm joking around with people in the mall and almost causing a riot. And um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was absolutely incredible. That was my, that was my one and, that wasn't my only Scranton experience. So that was amazing. It was, I, I, was, I was bigger than Justin Bieber, you know, <laughs> for a day. And, but then we went, when the office ended, we went to Scranton and we did a parade and all the office cast showed up and we had uh, screenings and Q and A's and a parade and Creed did a concert and Ed Helms played and there were thousands and thousands of office fans and it was this incredible raucous celebration. We stayed up till 4 a.m. Um, all the bars stayed open and it was, it was just nuts. So here's to you, great city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Woo! Um, you just bombed the lightning round, and it was totally worth it. Uh, okay. Uh, that was one sentence. <laughs> that was a very long sentence, but I liked it. Um, okay, a couple others to wrap with. One is, uh, what's the question you have for me? Um, <laughs> why occupational psychology? I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, and trying to fix other people's jobs seemed like a good way to get around the problem. That was one sentence. Very well done. I've been practicing. Uh, you've been doing a lot of work on climate change. You, in part, have a mission to make climate change fun and even occasionally funny. Can you tell us in a sentence how to do that? One sentence? Sure, I can do this in one sentence. And here continues the sentence into saying that I've been working with this nonprofit called Arctic Base Camp and now Climate Base Camp. And we try and speak science to culture and to power through using in, um, hysterical media activations that are attention grabbing and targeted towards the movable middle because too much climate work focuses only on converting the already converted or else arguing with the people that will never be converted of the importance of climate change. So the work needs to be done to the kids in Nebraska who don't know what the hell is going on with climate but can be brought over to the side of good through comedy. That was a sentence. <laughs> Woo! Um, do, you, do you have a favorite example of one of those activations? Uh, we, um, we towed an iceberg from Greenland to COP26 conference, climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland, and set it up in front of the conference center so that it was melting as the attendees were going into the conference. And we bottled the water from the iceberg and gave it out along with data points about the melting global ice sheet. And we got a lot of very interesting media play and it was also very hard hitting. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, you wanted to come back to the question about worst advice. Worst advice. I've gotten so much terrible advice. Um, you don't have to come back to it. I just wanted to give you another chance. Yeah. I'm going to pass because okay. nothing's That's coming fair. to mind. So I feel like um, I have a lot of takeaways from this conversation. I learned that you have a real vendetta against law and order. And a little bit Jeremy Piven. A little bit. I wasn't going to say it. Um, I also never thought I would see Dwight Schrute quote Sanskrit, which you can now all tell your friends and family that's what happened tonight. Um, what's a closing piece of advice or wisdom you'd love to share with our audience? You know, I, uh, at the end of uh, Soul Boom, I have uh, seven pillars of a spiritual revolution. And one of them is uh, wipe out cynicism, squash cynicism, and foster joy. I think the world is uh, in a difficult and dark transitional place, 
and it's very easy to get depressed and overwhelmed and feel like we, you, we, you, 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 don't have a part to play. But one of the most important things we can remember is that uh, I had an, uh, sorry, but I had an acting teacher, uh, Andre Gregory, who had the movie My Dinner with Andre, which everyone should see, back in the 70s. And I met with him once, and I told him I was feeling pessimistic and kind of run down. And he grabbed my arm, and he was like 80 years old. He grabbed my arm, and he was like, don't, don't do it. You need to be optimistic. You need to bring hope. You need to feel joy. Don't get cynical. You cannot get pessimistic. That's, if you're pessimistic, if you're cynical, they win. The forces of darkness want you to feel pessimistic, so you'll sit on your couch all day and do nothing. You've got to keep hope alive. And I really think that that is the clarion call for young people these days, that there is a lot of hope. Humanity can transform and come through uh, these very difficult and dark times to a much more beautiful uh, and uh, vital, connected world. That's not pie-in-the-sky, naive, eye-rolling daydreaming. That's absolutely true. And it's something we can all work for, even in a very small way. Beautifully said. Thank you for coming, Rain Wilson. Thank you. 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 All right. <laughs>